As you all know, we are studying the book of Acts, but the way that we are going about it is we are considering it from the standpoint of strategic evangelism. I think that this is one of the best ways to consider the book of Acts, seeing that this indeed is the strategy and the plan of Jesus Christ unfolding before our eyes. So far, what we've done is we've covered just a basic introduction, but we've noticed that Jesus gave a territory <clears throat> that he was wanting his disciples to work and to go through. Anybody remember what that territory was? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. If you keep in mind Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, this is all the land of Canaan as we would know it. And so what Jesus was interested in was retrieving the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But beyond that, he even suggests into the uttermost parts of the earth, which means that the gospel message would extend far beyond just the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It would also include the Gentiles, which we do see in the book of Acts. But in addition to this, what else did we learn so far? In Acts chapter 1, not only did Jesus give a territory that he was interested in working and pursuing, but he also identified that the first century church was in need of leaders. And so, in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 and following, we find the occasion where Judas Iscariot was being replaced. Remember, Judas had betrayed Jesus, had turned his back on the truth, and so now they were needing someone to replace his efforts so that there might be 12 apostles which would represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is where they find Matthias. But the point that we're making is, notice early on, even before the work begins, Jesus is already outlining where he wants them to go, who he wants to take lead, and what their requirements or qualifications were in order to carry out this awesome task. And what we discovered last Sunday is that this indeed is a lesson for us in the 21st century, that just like it was back in that time where Jesus was looking for leadership, Jesus remains to look for qualified men who can serve in these capacities so that the church might thrive and flourish. We looked briefly last Sunday morning for the lesson in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. This, incidentally, is the work that the leadership must engage in. They must engage in maturing the church, mentoring the church, protecting and cultivating the church. And so leaders are desperately needed for this particular effort. But what we're doing now is we're going to see what the emphasis in the book of Acts was. The emphasis can be found in Acts chapter 8. And notice with me verse 4. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. I guess that clip art didn't come through. But Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, I believe, is a good passage to help us put in perspective what the emphasis of the book of Acts would be. If you remember, Stephen as a prophet was standing before what some believe to be the Sanhedrin, and he was declaring that Jesus was in fact the Son of God. The Jewish leaders, not wanting to hear this type of declaration, eventually stoned him. From that point forward, we find out that the church was involved in heated persecution. And in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, you can read all about what's going on. Saul, who would later be identified as Paul, was there, and he made havoc of the church. Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. 
entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So there was a great stir at this moment. Not only was it politically incorrect to be a Christian, but socially they were ostracized and they were sought after to be killed. And so in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, the Bible says this, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. It was due to this persecution that the plan of Jesus Christ now began to unfold in the way that it did. You see, they were in Jerusalem. And rightfully so, because they were there during the time of Pentecost. It was the time that Jesus told them to remain in Jerusalem until they should receive power from on high. This would have been a central location for the people of Israel. But now Jesus, not only having given them this command, now the circumstances were that they were forced to go out to different locations. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So from this moment forward, we begin to see them reaching out to Samaria, eventually reaching out to the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 13, this is where the missionary journeys of Paul begin. And from that point forward into chapter 28, we see Paul traveling in various locations. But, but here, we wanted to emphasize this because now <clears throat> what we're going to see is that the preaching of the gospel took precedent. This is exactly what Jesus wanted his disciples to do. One of the last uh, commands that Jesus gave in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mark 16, 15 and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not believe shall be condemned. So this was the plan of Jesus Christ. Make certain that the message continued to be proclaimed. Well, let me ask you this. What was the message? Say that again. Christ is risen from the dead. Anybody else? What was the message? Indeed, it would have included Christ's resurrection. But stop and think for a moment. What was the message, Chris and then Diane? All right. He says the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. All right, Diana. All right. So the message would have definitely included Jesus Christ. But I submit to you that there was something even more. Not because I suggest it is, it's because you actually find it in the scriptures. All right, forgiveness of sins for the whole world. All right. I think y'all are missing one key element. All right, reconciliation, salvation. But there's one key message that I think we may be overlooking, and that is repentance. Repentance and remission of sins. So it wasn't just going into the world and letting them know, hey, y'all have salvation. But even before they were giving them this explanation that Jesus died for the world, they were out to tell them, hey, you have to change your life. So let's go back to Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 47. 
Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 47. And you may remember here that this is when Jesus is resurrected. He shows himself alive. And he's giving instruction to his, his disciples. Luke 24, you can really start in verse 44. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was well, when I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance was going to be a key message. This message was not something new. In fact, if you go back to the mission or the ministry of Jesus Christ, it was all about repentance. What was the message of John the baptizer when he came into this world? Anybody remember? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And his baptism in Mark chapter 1 and verse 4 was a baptism of repentance unto salvation for the forgiveness of sins. But it was repentance. When Jesus began preaching, what was he preaching as well? He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, but he was also saying, repent. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. When he sent out his apostles and his disciples during his ministry, what were they supposed to be proclaiming? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is near you. So when we come into the establishment of the church here in Acts chapter 1, we're finding that emphasis is going to be placed upon repentance. This is not to the neglect of remission of sins. All we're saying is, is that this is a key element in the proclamation of the gospel that I think sometimes we tend to overlook or take for granted. The reason why this is necessary to point out is because I think nowadays religion has been focused solely upon the grace of God, the grace of God, his salvation. And indeed, Jesus Christ, God the Father, is rich in mercy and grace. We cannot access that grace, however, except through faith. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. But this faith is going to be demonstrated through repentance. We fail often to emphasize the part that we play, the part that we must play in this salvation that Jesus Christ is offering. Jesus is giving us a divine negotiation. When we talk about grace, grace is God's favor that's been extended to us, acquitting us of our crimes, so to speak. But in extending this favor, God is making this divine negotiation. I'm willing to extend you this grace and acquit you of your crimes if you're willing to stop sinning, if you're willing to change your life. I think anybody in their right mind would understand this kind of a concept. Nowadays, you get on YouTube and you can see different courtroom scenes and uh, even on television, in some of the television shows and series, you might find a judge standing before a criminal or sitting before a criminal. And what does the judge say? Here I see you again. I told you last time that if I were to see you in my court, I was going to sentence you. But due to the circumstances, I have mercy on you. And... I'm going to go ahead and acquit you of your crime, but this better be the last time I see you in my court. You know, something of that nature kind of unfolds in these TV series 
or if you're watching something on YouTube. But the point that I'm making is, is that the judge has the ability to make this negotiation with you. I'm going to not sentence you and hold you accountable if you are willing to change your life and you have to prove that you're willing to change your life. Well, this is where repentance comes in. And so bringing, or rather beginning with the ministry of Jesus throughout the Acts of the Apostles, the message remained the same, repentance and remission of sins. So let's go ahead and begin with our first message found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. I was going to say, does anybody remember where repentance was preached, but I already have the scripture up there. <laughs> but think about what's going on. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles, and they began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. These were not their own words, but rather the words that the Holy Spirit had taught them. And so they proclaimed the message of God. What was that message? The message was that the prophecies of old have now been fulfilled. What they were witnessing was God's promise to send them this inspiration by the Holy Spirit so that they might be guided on how they should live. What did the message proclaim? That Jesus was in fact the Son of God. He proved himself to be the Son of God by miracles, signs, and wonders which he did in their midst, Acts 2 and verse 22. From that time forward, now Peter begins to proclaim the prophecies of 2 Samuel chapter 7, Psalm uh, 18. And he's describing how Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And he concludes in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom you have crucified has been, has been made both Lord and Christ. So what do the people say in verse 37? And when they heard these things, they were pricked in their heart, the Bible says. In other words, the message that Peter proclaimed affected their conscience. They began to make these connections and they understood what they were doing and what they had done was wrong. There's that sense of guilt. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What do we do? This is true what you're saying, Peter. What do we do? And what's the first word out of Peter's mouth? Repent. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. But the first word was repentance. So what does the word repent mean? You know, years ago, I was speaking to an individual out in California, and one of the things that he frequently brought up to me was how in preaching and in religion, we use a lot of ecclesiastical terms. And he said, basically, this is the nomenclature among religious people. And maybe we've learned this language, maybe we haven't, but he said for the typical person who didn't grow up in religion, they may not fully comprehend what it means to repent or the concept of the church. And he came up with the whole list. So I say to you, what does repentance mean? All right. From the Greek word metanoia, making reference to a changing of the mind. And so the key concept would be change. You know, years ago, there was a presidential campaign that used to promote this concept of change. That concept was promoted long ago. And the change that was being promoted back in the time of Jesus was not the kind of change that individuals were suggesting of changing the social standards of marriage, and transgenderism, no, but rather it was a change from wickedness to righteousness. That's what John the Baptizer, Jesus, the 12 apostles, and the first century church was tasked to preach change. Change for what? For the better. And so what we're tasked to do as a church 
is we're tasked to go out into the world to help people understand that they should be willing to change their lives, their actions, their attitudes. But how are we going to do this? How are we going to persuade someone to change? Anybody know? Very good. I think that's a very concise answer. What message will we then begin to help people understand so that they can see this new life that we're living? That Jesus has given us a second opportunity. There's where his death, his burial, and his resurrection come into play. We're given a second opportunity. I know that we've really messed up life. I know that we've really made a mess of things. You might be carrying with you on your shoulder this baggage of what has happened in the past. You might be fearful of what you're going to do in the future, but rest assured if you will change, then Jesus is promising a second chance. He's promising a better life. So we're not only telling them to change so that they can leave wickedness and turn to righteousness, we're actually going to help them understand that we have something better to offer now, the wisdom of Christ. And that wisdom makes for a better and happier life. You think about, in a psychological standpoint, what are people after? Happiness, joy? Well, if that is what they're after, how do they go about trying to accomplish or achieve that happiness? Well, some try to go about accomplishing it with wealth. Some try to go about accomplishing it with sexual immorality, with drug abuse, with violence. Whatever the case might be in the world, there are various things that people chase after thinking that this is going to give them a sense of fulfillment or a sense of joy and happiness, when in reality, once they hit that point, it actually has brought drama to their lives. They might be working and uh, they neglect their families, or they might try to come up with some get-rich-quick scheme and break the law. They might be looking for their soulmates, but in so doing, they've engaged in sexual immorality, betrayal. They have violated the covenant of marriage. They might be seeking some sense of high to escape the world, and instead of focusing upon righteousness, they find that in their minds in a bottle or at a pipe in drug abuse. The point that I'm making is, is that the world has their values and these concepts all mixed up and confused. What we're doing, and we, as we go out into the world, we're trying to help people see there is joy that can be... Um, received, but it doesn't come through the kind of life that you would think it comes through. It comes through a different means. True joy is working it out with your spouse. True joy is working hard for the things that you enjoy from a physical standpoint of the possessions. True joy is finding a different type of escape and not through alcoholism or drug abuse. That's where true joy is going to come, and the only one who is demonstrating and teaching us this is Jesus Christ. And we're here to show you that there's a different way to live. Repent, change, and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive this true joy, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and understanding that you now have received eternal life, and if you can maintain this obedience on the day of your death, that joy will be solidified with presence of God. Any questions or comments? So this message was proclaimed continuously. This isn't the first time or the last time 
But seeing that this was what Jesus had commanded the church to engage in, Acts 2.38 from the very beginning. Well, what about the next chapter in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19? Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It's identical to Acts 2.38. But what's happening here? Peter again is proclaiming the salvation of Jesus, but notice the object lesson, if I can call it that, that is given. Verse 11 now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. The object lesson was, here was this, this invalid man, and he was asking for assistance, and Peter and John said, silver and gold have we none, but what we have we'll give to you. So they healed him. This was representative of a better life. From a physical standpoint, he was healed, but from a spiritual standpoint, he was also going to give the opportunity to have his depressions, his anxieties, his guilt healed. And now, as Peter is proclaiming this message, he is going all the way back to the prophets and explaining to them that this is exactly what the prophets proclaimed in verse 22. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And so they're asking, what shall we do? Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Change. Let your heart be transformed. For what reason? So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing, what does that have to do with? A sense where now we are satisfied with life. Remember in John chapter 4 when Jesus was met with the woman of Samaria? And he utilizes this figure about life everlasting through water. Whoever shall drink of this water, he says, will require more water. But whoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him will have life everlasting. What was he suggesting? A sense of refreshment. So that once we imbibe into the Spirit's teachings and we have our feel then we would have a sense of refreshment for the life that we now live. And so Peter here is making reference to this very same point, repent therefore and be converted. What about Acts chapter 11 and verse 18? Acts chapter 11 and verse 18. This is where Peter was given an account of Cornelius the Gentiles now allowed to hear the gospel. And in Acts chapter 11 and verse 18, the Bible reads, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted the Gentiles repentance to life. Notice, they're talking about their salvation. They're talking about the hearing of the gospel. But the way they summarized it was, God granted the Gentiles repentance to life. What about Acts chapter 17? Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. <clears throat> you may remember there that Paul is standing before Mars Hill. This was a popular location for the philosophers who typically went to these places to exchange or discuss some new ideas. And in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, Paul is expressing to them the true and living God. And after he goes through an explanation that God indeed has made himself known, this is what he says God is looking for. In Psalm, or rather in Acts 17, 30 and 31, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. 
because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given us assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. By the very fact that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, this tells us that there will be a resurrection one day. And if there will be a resurrection one day, well then what are we to do while we still live? God now commands everyone everywhere to repent. That was the message that Paul was getting towards. Yes, he talked about Jesus, he talked about salvation, but the central idea was we need to change our ways. And when we do change, we have salvation awaiting us through his blood. And then what about Acts chapter 26, 19 and 20? Acts chapter 26, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. You see what I mean? I think we tend to overlook this point. We're so eager to, to go and share people, share with people, you have salvation, your sins can be forgiven. But sometimes we fail to actually emphasize what Jesus is after, and that's the changing of their lives. This is seen sometimes whenever you might be proclaiming the gospel, and um, you are not emphasizing the plan of salvation. Well, what is the plan of salvation? Anybody, very quickly, the plan of salvation? <laughs> Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. We might teach someone and they have heard, and we kind of skip the uh, repentance, and go straight to the baptism. Let's say, for instance, two individuals that may, may be living together but are not married. You teach them the gospel, that requires some repentance for them to come out of that situation. Maybe you're teaching someone who is involved in alcoholism. They've heard the gospel, but it requires some repentance, some change. And so what I'm simply suggesting is, is that sometimes we might jump the gun. We've taught them the gospel. Oh, I want to be baptized. Great, that's great. But as Acts chapter 26 here demonstrates in verse 20, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. By no means am I saying that we're supposed to police people, that we're supposed to be over them and kind of watching them. All I'm suggesting, however, is, is that we definitely need to make certain that we communicate to them that having heard the gospel, what this means is that you need to stop the things that you're doing. Because if you're going to be baptized and you're still remaining in your sin, well, then you've frustrated the grace of God. Any questions or comments on this point? So considering this, we find that this indeed was the message. And what I want you to notice from this moment forward as we continue to discuss perspectives on the book of Acts regarding strategic evangelism, they had a territory, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. They had leadership, the apostles, and as well as the book of Acts begins to unfold, they chose leaders to be evangelists. They chose elders. They established congregations. They had leadership. Now what we're noticing is that they had a uniform message. The message was the same. I know that we are autonomous, meaning every congregation of the Lord's body is self-governing, but one thing that truly irks me sometimes is when you'll go to website after website and you'll see different messages, different taglines, different mottos of the church. 
I understand this might be representative of that particular congregation, but the uniform message that we should all be proclaiming regardless of where we might find ourselves, whether in Texas or Montana, should be repentance, remission of sins. This was the message that Jesus began to preach in his ministry, and this is the message that he wanted to continue be preached, to be preached during the first century church's establishment. So if that be the case, well then how are we going to pursue now our evangelistic efforts? This is the reason why when we talk about evangelism, we have to begin talking about holiness. Holiness. You might remember a few months ago, there was a series of lessons that we gave having to do with the blueprint of our existence. Why do we exist? You ever thought about that? Why do we exist? We were made in the image of God. Genesis 1, 27 and 28, or 26 and 27. And being made in his image, what does God proclaim for us? Be ye holy, for I am holy. What does that mean? If we were made in his image, and he's holy, holy, well then, we must be holy because we were made in his image. So then, our purpose for existence is to learn to become like God. What does that mean? To live a life separate and apart from sin. Has God given us the means? Yes. He's given us a perfect word, which teaches us how to be holy. He's given us remission of sins, which cleanses our sins so that we might be holy. He's given us his spirit, which sanctifies our inward man. So there is no excuse as to why we shouldn't be holy. But the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because this goes right in line with the concept of repentance. We're teaching repentance because at the end of the day, what God is after is our holiness, our obedience. And this will only begin with the mindset that we must change our thinking, change our actions, and therefore change our end. Any last questions or comments? Well, we appreciate your time. Next Sunday, we will continue as we start to see the strategy unfold and consider how we as a church must mimic the first century's strategy. We'll go ahead and stand dismiss until the worship.